All right, so here we go. All right, so first of all, I do now have an Amazon EC2 account. So we're going to go into that. And we're going to create an instance. Oh, I'm not signed in, okay. Here we go. I prefer to use the quick launch wizard. So I'm going to select Ubuntu server. It really doesn't matter if you pick this one or this one, but the, the difference between the two is that LTS means long-term support, which means that if you are trying to keep your system up to date as far as updates and things like that, you might want to go LTS, but truly it, it doesn't really matter in, in this sort of environment. If you're with a company and they have all kinds of requirements as far as staying compliant with different industry standards, you might choose to go to the LTS, and that's what we'll do for this, but there, there's really functionally little difference between the two. So we need to give it a name. I'm just going to call it Live Stream Startup. All right key pair. So in order to access the server, I am going to need to have what is called an SSH key, which is how I'm going to authenticate to the server. So for that, I'm, I've got to give it a name. I'm just going to call it live stream startup key. Why not? All right. I'm just going to save this file. And now I can, I don't really need that. So I'll just continue. And yeah, see where it says free tier eligible right here? That's how you know it's on the free tier. Also type T1 micro. So this is completely free tier. All right, for what we're doing, this is fine. Um, I, I might want to create a, a separate security group for this just so that I don't have to change it later, so I might as well do that. All right. Notice where it says delete on termination. This means that as soon as we terminate this machine, whatever we have done on it, whatever we've done on the hard disk is also going to be deleted. Now, I'm not 100% sure how the free tier works as far as, as far as this goes. You might want to check into it. I do know that keeping an 8 gigabyte hard drive is going to be very little cost, so I'm just going to take the risk here, and if, if there's a small amount of cost, that's fine. I just don't want to each session move files back into the server, so I'm just going to leave it like this. My guess is there's probably a way to have free tier and, and not have it charge you, and, and who knows, it might not charge me anyways. So what, I'm, what I've just done here is I've said don't delete the hard drive when I turn off the machine, which is rather an important thing. So save details, and let's do one more thing here. I'm going to create a new security group. I'm going to give it a name, let's just say short for security. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create one rule which allows me to access the server from any IP address on port 22 which will allow me to to remotely administer the server. So if you want to SSH into the server you're going to need to create this rule. We're also going to create one later for web access. In fact, we might as well do that now. 
there it is. And we're going to do one for port 80, which is just general websites, and one for 443, which is SSL. So if you're HTTP and HTTPS, basically. All right, now that looks good, so we'll save that. Oh, what is it saying there? You have not yet created. Oh, create. Now that should be good. And let's see if it actually saved what I wanted it to. I'll check that in a minute. But that's fine. If it didn't, we can edit it later. So this looks fine. And we'll launch. While that is going on, let's go into our downloads directory. And there's the key that we're going to use when we SSH into the server. We can close this. Now we basically have to wait for this thing to start up. Now it's going to have an IP address. There it is, 172.31. So that's what we're going to use when we SSH into the server. So if you were using, let's say, Windows, you might use PuTTY or you might use Zoc, Z-O-C or PuTTY for this. I'm in Ubuntu which has an SSH program built into its terminal so I'm just going to say SSH Ubuntu at 172. Now this isn't going to work right away and I'll show you why. Well two reasons, it's probably not up yet number one, but number two I haven't told it to use my key yet. I just want to show you that. So we know it's not up yet, so let's try it again. Oh, and I bet the security rules we made didn't actually get placed into it. Let's take a look at that security group. We can move this over more. Yeah, no rules were found. Okay, so let's uh, change that. So let's see, where do I go? Security groups. Inbound. Oh, they're all there. Well, if they're all there, then why did it say nothing was found? View rules. Okay. <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. This is the right security group. The rules are there. So it should be fine. All right, so let me just see if if it works. But it's not listening to anything I'm telling it to do, so why not? This shouldn't happen. Just for the fun of it, I am actually going to see if somehow this interface isn't showing me everything it's supposed to be showing me. Mm, let's see. It says to use Livestream Startup SEC for the security group, and that security group is clearly set up properly. And it clearly has the right rules. Unless, yeah, this is fine too. So this should be fine. And what I should see when I 
clicked on view rules here is I should actually see the rules that I gave it. And I don't. So I'm actually just going to probably create a new instance until it's used that security group and see what happens. So that really should work. Yeah, that should really work fine. All right, so let's try that again. So we're going to go back here. Why not? We'll use that key. That's fine. That's fine. Use that group. Don't delete it when you terminate the server. Let's see if that's any different. Yeah, look at that. So when I click View Rules here, obviously the rules are in place. So apparently there's some bug somewhere probably at Amazon with this one. Because when I view rules here, well, there you go. Now it's decided to let the rules actually show up for some magical reason but it still won't let me tell it into that on port 22 which is peculiar All right, so what about this one what's oops, what is this IP address five four this is the IP address I just have to replace this with dots Five, okay, so telnet 54.200.61.19. Okay, good. So this works. So now I can go ahead and SSH into it. So SSH Ubuntu at 54.200.61.19. Now it's not going to work because I haven't told it to use the key yet. It's going to deny me access, which is what I want because I don't want just anyone to be able to access this server. I only want to be able to access it. So what I'm going to do is SSH-I, then I'm going to specify where the key is. Now, if you're using something like PuTTY or Zoc, there's going to be a, a thing where you specify where, where the key is, and each program is a little different, but there will be an option when you're creating a new connection. It'll say, where is your SSH key, and that's where you'll put this file. In my case, it's right there. And then Ubuntu at, and then that IP address, 54.200.61.191. Now I should get in with no problem. And there we go, I am in. So this server here, you can see by this message, I'm actually logged into the Amazon server. I'm not logged into my machine here. So if I if I do an, a list, if I go to this same directory that I was just in for the key, you'll see it doesn't even exist because I'm logged into the remote server here. I'm not logged into my own machine. Now I've closed that connection and I'm back to my own machine here. So we know that that works. Now there's one other thing I want to do here. I don't like typing the IP address every time. I don't want to memorize the IP address. So I'm going to edit this file, etsy slash host, and I'm going to create an entry for it for that IP address. And I'm going to call it live stream startup. Now I can do this. Ubuntu at live stream startup. And then whenever I want that server, I can do that and I'll get right in. And now it'll just go straight in. Perfect. Okay, so that much is in place. Alright, so let's get into the server and actually hmm. let's see how do I want to do this never made a screen RC file here did I hmm. 
All right, give me one second here. I need to get a file from one of my other servers. Won't take long. It's just a configuration file. So I'm going to briefly close the stream and I'll be back with you guys here in just a second. All right, everyone, so here is the file that I was trying, well, first, do I have screen? Yeah, of course I have it here. Um, App get install just means I want to install whatever program I'm specifying, in this case, screen. Now, okay, I already have screen, so now, the screen RC file, which is what I went to go get, and don't worry, I'll save this as a text file or I'll put it on the subreddit or something, but what this does is it just makes my screen session look the way I want, which is like this, where I have the window title here, and it, it's just a nice layout for what I like to do. All right. Okay, so I need to do one thing before I do that. I want my escape key to be control A, not control B. And what that means is when I'm in screen and I push control A and then let's say C, I'll create a new screen session down here. And I can create as many as I want. I can give them whatever name I want, you know, like development, whatever. And then I can jump between my screens like this with control A, N, that means the next window, control A, P, previous, and if I want to change the name, it's control A, and then uh, shift A, and so on. There's, there's all kinds of nice um, cheat sheets out there on, on how to do this. This is called GNU screen. All right, so this is, the reason I use this is because I can do this. If I push control A and D, I can detach from my screen session. And you notice how it gives me that number right there, 1765, that's the that's the process ID number, PID, for that screen session. So now if I log out of my server here completely, and I'm completely logged out, and let's say it's the next day and I log back in, sudo bash just means makes me root again. And then I screen dash ls, I can see what screens are active, and there's that number 1765. And then if I screen dash x 1765, ta da, I'm right back into my screen session, wherever I was before, whatever files I'm editing, on, everything. And so wherever I'm, in, wherever I'm at physically, I can get back into the server and, and do whatever I need to do. So it's very convenient. Okay, so now we're going to need to install Apache. So app get install Apache 2. I could actually, yeah, why not? Here, I'm going to install this in all at once. So I want Apache 2, I want PHP 5, I want curl, and I want MySQL server. That should work. Now it's just going to install all of it. Actually, first it looked like it couldn't find some of those URLs, so I'm doing an app get update first, which will tell it to refresh everything it knows about where to get its packages, and then I will run the app get install. Actually, I might do one other thing first, which is app get upgrade, which will bring all the current packages to date. So I'll do that first. While that's happening, 
And this is the nice thing about screen, I don't have to wait, and I can do a couple other interesting things. In Linux, if you're ever curious what exact version you have, if you look at this file, slash etc slash lsb dash release, it will tell you exactly what what uh, version you have. So I can see that I'm running Ubuntu 12.04 LTS long-term support. So that's just something. Another thing is uname-a will give you the more specific of uh, what kind of Linux you're running as far as the kernel. You can see it's 64-bit and this is still going. Come on, finish up already. Be more specific when you say which. Just in general, the which command tells you where a file is located, where an executable file is located. So if I type which bash, it'll show me that is the exact location of that command. But that's not the same thing as seeing, as, as seeing what version of Linux and what release you're using. So the fact that this upgrade command is taking a while basically means that this server that we've obtained from Amazon isn't really up to date, so it, it's good to do this. It's good to make sure that everything is brought current. And don't worry about those warning disk does not exist. That is likely just simply because this is on Amazon. It, it doesn't have any effect. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure what that is, but I know that it always happens and I don't worry about it. Okay, done. So now, if I rerun my apt-get command, I have a hunch it will actually work. And there we go. We're not seeing any 404s on the URLs it's trying. Okay, so I have to create a MySQL root password. Um, I'm just going to do that. There we go. We're probably not even going to get into very much MySQL in this session. Okay, good, that's all done. So I can test to see if Apache is really installed, the same way I did when it was on my home machine, and I can see that it is. Now here's the fun part. I should be able to see that I can access it over the internet now if I know that IP address, which I don't, but it gives it to me right here. So I can copy and paste that and just change it to dots. That's, of course, assuming that that's the IP address. Okay, let's use that one instead. That's the private. Okay, that's the private IP address, so I'm not going to be able to access it over the internet. This one I will, though. I don't need you there. Okay, so here you go. Now, if you, on your own computers, put in this IP address into a web browser, you will get exactly what you see here, because this is now accessible over the internet. What we have done is we have set up a server at Amazon that is serving our content to the internet. Now, 
here's something else. This file, authlog, in the slash ver slash log directory, allows us to see if someone attempts to access this server without, ac uh, with, without authorization. So if I type this command, tail.f auth.log, I can watch the file live as things happen. So if, for example, at this very moment someone tried to log into the server and they didn't have the right credentials, they wouldn't be able to. Now, how do I create it? There we go. So let's try that just for the fun of it. So I'm going to try to um, SSH into, I'm not even going to use the right username. And take a look. Let's see, possible break in attempt, invalid user. And what you can do, and what I recommend you do, although this is later on down the road, is you should set up a simple kind of alerting system that if something like that happens, you get a little page to your phone or an email sent to you or something on those lines. That's what you do if you're in a professional setting. You don't, you a, you don't want people to access your server without having authorization and B you want to know if they try because otherwise if you let them try enough who knows they might figure out some way in and what you want to do is if you see that someone is trying to access your server you should block their IP address I'll show you how to do that later alright but there you go so this is just a little side note about how security works alright so I'm going to get out of that tail-f auth.log. Now, if I go into the Apache directory here, no, I don't want to thin that. Let's let's cat it. Okay, access log. Okay, so here I can actually see everyone who has tried accessing this page. And if I tail-f that file, someone try to connect to it right now. Anyone just go to the IP address that you see, and you'll actually see your entry appear here. There, see? So anytime someone tries to go to this IP address, I can see it, and I can see exactly what what they are seeing. There you go. Now, the next thing is, I can see exactly what page they're requesting. So, for example, suppose I do this. Suppose I go to this address slash sum URL. And you can see right there, I can see exactly what was attempted to be accessed. All right, so let's see if PHP works. Yep, it does, and I know it does because I see the word testing right there. And now let's make sure it works on the web here. And now, there we go. So that's good. And let's see. All right, I suppose this is a good time to start making our MVC framework. Let's see. So. First of all, I don't want all of my files in ver slash www. I want to create subdirectories here for different things that I'm going to have. I want to have a directory for, well, first of all, I haven't installed Git, so let's do that. Okay. All right, here we go. Where is our, let's see if I have, have better success with GitHub today than I had two days ago. Yeah, I'll do that later. All right, so. There's my clone URL. Perfect. And now I can see I have everything that I had from two days ago into this live stream startup directory. So here's what I'm going to do. First of all, let's 
make sure I can change things here. Okay, I need to do this. All right. Okay. Okay, good. Now, good. Excellent. Okay, so that's all working perfectly. Okay, so now I want to change my Apache configuration so that it's not looking in var slash www anymore. I want it to be looking in var www live stream startup. So let's see. No, that's not right. Ah. Okay, so if this worked properly, then this should just say testing. It does. Okay, good. And just to make 100% sure. Okay, good. All right. So now I want to start creating a few subdirectories here. I'm going to want a directory for my classes. Uh, templates and hmm. yeah that's fine for now all right and I want to make one more change here obviously I don't want people to be able to directly access these directories so I'm going to create one more directory here called public why not Oops. Okay. Now So this is going to be my main controller file. So if you go to this URL, that's what you'll see. Okay, now the next thing I need is of course my HT access file. So for that, I'll just go ahead and see what it looks like again. Where is it? There we go. Oops, I want it down here. That just enabled mod rewrite. Okay, leaving the closing tag off for PHP is actually what you want to do if you are writing PHP that, how do I want to say this? How do I want to say this? There's two ways you can write PHP. You can do what's called inline PHP, where you're kind of writing a mix of HTML and PHP, where you're going to have some PHP code, some HTML code, some PHP code. And there's other times when you're just going to write what would be basically code, like any other programming language, in PHP, where you're not really writing any HTML. You're just writing pure PHP, and you want that file to be 
interpreted as pure PHP. In that case, you don't want to put the the end tag at the end because otherwise you create a risk where if the file gets saved with an extra new line character at the end of the file, it won't work right for all kinds of things like headers, all kinds of reasons like that. So just in general, you only want to put the the closing tag, this, at the end of your PHP if there is a reason for it. Otherwise, leave it open because then it says that the whole entire thing is going to be parsed as PHP. Okay, so this should be good. Alright, so now we can test that this works because... Ah. I can already see that I made a small mistake here. Very small. This should say slash index.php. And Okay, it's not working yet, so why not? Oh, I know why. Because I didn't actually set the allow override in Apache, so let's do that. Yeah, why not? I'm just setting it everywhere even though I know I don't need to. Just quicker that way. Why doesn't it like that? Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, so any questions so far? All I've done at this point is more or less brought us to exactly the point where we were yesterday except on an actual internet facing server. So anyone have any questions? All right, so let's continue. So what we've done now is we've made it so that no matter what URL I put here, it will always treat it as if I have typed this. Always, no matter what I do. And the reason is because it's saying the rewrite rule here is this translates to anything, and no matter what I type, it will be treated as index.php. That's the whole point. The exceptions here, which is what these two are for is specific files, I believe, specific files or directories that actually exist. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what that is. All right, now, and then I could be wrong on that. All right, so let's see. Now what we want to do is make sure that it's not possible to access directories and files that we don't want access to. I already know this is the case, but just for the sake of demonstration, let's create a file here called test.txt in the classes directory. Oops, that's fine. Who cares if there's a typo? Now if I try to access that directory like this, what is it? test.txt. Notice it's still just accessing index.php. 
which is what you want. You don't want people to be able to directly access files other than where you are permitting them access to. If they can access that, then maybe they can see your source code and maybe they can figure out vulnerabilities and you don't want that. All right. Now here I can see with git status, I can see exactly what needs to be committed to git. And I can see this index.php has been changed. Why not? So if I type git add star, it will add any files that need to be added in and git commit dash m message, whatever message you want. And finally git push. If you want to put it into your main repository. There we go. Okay. Now just because this is a public repository, why don't I do this? Okay, so what I just did is I put a, the HD access file I wrote and the screen RC that I use into the GitHub repository that if, so that if someone needs them, they can get it right there. All right, so the next thing I want to do here is I don't really like typing in the IP address. I want to imagine that I'm on a website. So I am going to edit my local, meaning on this machine I'm going to lo uh, edit my local Etsy host file. And by the way, on Windows there's a file just like this and it works in the exact same way. Well, I've already done that. And basically what you can do is you can put an entry in that file. I believe it's c colon slash windows slash system32 slash hosts dot txt. It's something like that. And then you can put an entry here with this IP address and then the name like Livestream Startup. And then when you want to go to that URL, you can just do this. And it'll work exactly the same way. So that's that's a nice thing to do. and I can even do this. I'm not root. There we go. and works the same way. Now the nice thing about that is the actual IP address that the real domain livestreamstartup.com is pointing to right now is not the same as what I'm doing this development on. But if you write it into your host file you'll overwrite whatever it was. You can basically set any anything you want there to any IP address. So if you're doing development work on a server and let's say you don't want to edit the files that are live, you want to edit the development files, but you still want to be able to access the URL as if it was live, that's how you would do it. You would point your host file to the IP address of the server that you're actually wanting to work on. So let's say, for example, you have, you're part of a team of several developers and you want to edit some code on your own computer you don't want it to actually affect anyone who can access it over the internet, you could go ahead and create a host entry for the actual domain of that company, make the changes you're going to make, and it'll only ever affect you. And that's sometimes necessary because some, sometimes the source code reads the URL bar to see exactly what domain you're on and stuff like that. So that's the idea there. I should be able to demonstrate that too if I can 
remember exactly what that server variable is, but I can't write offhand, so we'll do that later. All right, so the next thing I want to do here is when someone goes to the main domain, I want there to be a page, a simple HTML page. So I'm just going to make this extremely simple. Okay, now just very brief HTML introduction here. In HTML you have opening tags and closing tags. Closing tags are exactly like the opening tag except they have a slash before the name. So this is the HTML opening tag, this is the closing tag. There's two parts to a general HTML document, the head and the body. The body is where the actual content of the page goes. In this case, the only content we have is, is this is a test. The head, think of those as things that aren't necessarily visible in the content but might matter, like the title of the page, for example. All right, so that's very basic. Now, there's no way to actually see the content of that page yet because if I try to access, let's just say I try to go to template slash index.html, it won't work because I've already said no matter what URL I put in I want I want to use index.php so what I have to do is I have to teach index.php to understand that if they go directly to this URL I want it to use that file so here's how I do that first I need to see exactly what URL they're on so let's say um, The request URI is the name of the URL. The request URI is the technical term for whatever you put in the URL. So for example, why did that happen? I did save this and I'm not in the public directory and this file shouldn't even exist. There we go. So you see that the URI here is slash testing. So if I want this to be the home page where someone's just gone straight to the domain, can anyone here tell me what I would want the request URI to be? Any ideas? Slash testing would give me this and if you go straight to the domain it's just going to be a slash at the end so the request URI in this case, no, nope, it it just be slash. See, watch. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. There. See, if you go straight to the domain, look at what the request URI actually is set to. It's just slash. Yep, that's it. So I can put a very simple if statement here, like so. First, I'm going to make a few changes. I don't like my tabs to be so large. So set tab width equals four. Yeah. I'll save those in a global Vim settings here in a little while. All right, that's better now. My tabs aren't as far. All right, so if the request URI is slash home page, else not, oops, home page. So we can test that by saying you are on the home page and and you can see that it works just fine Now the next thing we want to do is we want to say that if you are on the home page, 
we want to use that index.tpl file. So there's a real easy way that we can do this. We can just say Now we are in the public directory. We want to be in templates slash index.html. And there you go. And if I view the source of the page, you'll see already that we have properly done what we wanted to do here. So we can create different template files for different things that we're going to want to display. And that's the basics of an MVC framework. So let me explain the idea of an MVC framework. MVC is short for Model View Controller. The controller is the brain of the whole thing. The controller is the thing that looks at the URL someone typed in, their session variables, who they are, their IP address, what, whatever it is you want to look at, and it figures out this is who this person is and this is what they are supposed to see or access, whatever the case is that is your program, your controller. Then you have your view. Now you can think of your view as the literal view of what you're seeing, like here this is our view, or more accurately, no not that, I want to see the full page source. This is the view, the, the final output, what is going to be shown to an end user is the view. The model aspect of MVC refers to the actual data that is going to be used, be it stored in a database or whatever, that, that's going to be actually used where it's going to be, the controller is going to grab the data, use it to construct a view and then display the view. So the, the basic idea of a model view controller is separating your data from your code and having a mechanism where you have one program, which can be as extensive as you want, have as many classes as you want, that handles all incoming requests. So you don't, for example, have one PHP file handle, let's say you go to slash account slash profile.php and you have a totally separate profile.php script as you have, let's say, slash, um, I don't know, new user.php and that's a totally separate program. You don't do that. In a, in a model view controller situation, you have one controller that handles all incoming requests and figures out what to do with it and then uses that information to construct the view of what the person's going to see, do whatever behind the scenes operations and this is good because it keeps everything consistent. That's the basic idea behind a model view controller. So now we have a very basic situation here which is if you go to the home page you'll get to see this is a test. Now, let's suppose we want to do something a little more creative here. What if we want to have, now I'm going to actually use my second screen here. Let's suppose we want this, this um, right here where it says this is a test, we want that to be dynamic. like this. And we want this to be filled in with anything we want. Now if I just do the change I just did, you'll see that, oops, let me take out that. You'll see that it just shows text, but how can we change that? Well, the answer is we could do something like this. And what did I do wrong here? I think I used str replace wrong. Let's see. Yeah, I did. There we go. Okay, so 
we can basically make that text whatever we want. So if we really want to, we could, for example, let's let's say we want something like this slash. This is just for illustrative purposes, but. All right, so let's say I want something like that, and I wanted to actually say, hello, Carl. Well, for that, I'm going to need to read the URL. I'm going to need to find Carl in it. So here's how we can do that. First of all, I'm going to say that if we're not on the home page. Now, what I just did might seem very confusing. For this to work, see how it says you are not on the home page, which means we would execute this chunk of code down here. I don't want to move all of this code down here, so I'm just changing the equality statement here to flip it around without moving the code. So I'm just saying, if the request URL is not a single slash, then I want it to do all the stuff here. And you see that now, instead of it saying you're not on the home page, it'll give me this code here. So now let's do this. We're going to start by figuring out what the request URI is and we want to look for slash name slash whatever's in name. So a nice way to do this, don't worry if this looks like sorcery, except I want that to be anything A to Z. What am I doing? I'll write it first and then I'll explain it. Make sure I'm doing it right so far. Yep. Or, more specifically, and so on. And if you have the IP address, you can go in your own web browser and see that this works just fine. All right, so let's let's discuss what I did here. PREG match is one of my favorite functions in PHP, although it's actually Perl. Um, P in the PREG match means Perl. That's where this originated. What I'm basically able to do here is match any string of text for any criteria I want, pull out any bit of that information, and do whatever I want with it. So first of all, these parentheses right here, which it actually highlights in blue nicely, I have to put parentheses around whatever I'm trying to pull out of this. So in this case, I'm looking for in the URL slash name, like here slash, we have name and then slash, and then I want whatever comes next which is bounded by parentheses. And I'm saying A to Z. It can be any character from A to Z, and then the plus means repeated any number of times. So, for example, let's just, I'm just going to move this over here. So this would match anything at all. Well, I haven't specified uppercase or lowercase, but this is going to match anything at all that is any character from A to Z. However, over here, at the end of my second exclamation mark, I have this little IMSX. These are options that I'm telling PREG to use. The I means case insensitive, which means that my A to Z here is going to match lowercase and uppercase. If I want it to only match lowercase, I can just delete that I, and now it'll only match lowercase. If I want it to still match lowercase and uppercase, I can do this. A to Z, A to Z, um, uppercase and lowercase. And now it'll match any uppercase letters or lowercase letters. But it's easier just to have the I in here. It looks cleaner. So what I'm saying here is look at the request URI. Look for name slash. And then after that, find any number of characters and save that into a variable called whatever I named it here, whatever I want to call it. I didn't have to call it dollar sign P matches, that's just force of habit. And then whatever is in the first parentheses is going to be saved as element one of that array. So that's why it's P matches one here. So that's what I'm doing. 
So here already you can see that we've demonstrated the first idea behind the MVC framework. The dynamic part of the of the content here, text, can really be filled in with whatever we want. And if we imagine that this is a completely built out web page, we could even hire a web designer to build the page however we want. And they don't have to know any of the PHP code. They don't even need to know PHP because all they would be doing is editing this file, which is another reason why MVC is a good way to go because if you have multiple developers, you can have the guys who are good with PHP working on one thing and the people who are good working with web, de web design and web development on the other side of things and, and so on. So you can divide roles and responsibilities a lot easier. And it's always good to have your HTML code here, your PHP code there, and your JavaScript there and not try to mix them together. It makes, not only does it make it cleaner code, it also means you don't have to put out an ad for somebody who knows everything you're doing. You can put out an ad for someone who is just good with HTML or just good with PHP and so on. All right, so that is the end of this session as far as the work goes. So I'm going to open it up for questions and answers now. So anyone who has any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, so if you want Apache to respond to any URL, there's a few things you need. First of all, you need the htaccess file, which needs to be called .htaccess, and it needs to look like this. Secondly, you need to have an index.php file in your main public HTML directory that, uh, if you don't have that, obviously this isn't going to work because you're saying take anything that comes in and rewrite it as that. You also need to enable mod rewrite which is what this is. The rewrite engine is mod rewrite and you do that by typing a2n mod rewrite as a command. You, you run that command and you'll enable mod rewrite and lastly you need to edit the file etc slash apache2 slash sites enabled slash this right here and you can just keep pushing tab like see if I if I write in part of the file name and I push tab it'll auto complete the rest and when you edit that file you want to do a few things make sure that your document root is set correctly to whatever directory you actually have your your index.php in and your .ht access in and then also make sure that all instances where you see the words allow override must be set to all because that's what lets the .ht access file work at all. So that's basically all you have to do and if you still have problems with that just let me know on the subreddit and I'll help you out. Okay, so next question. Oh, it's it's mainly because I'm doing this as a for fun side project and by actually building an MVC framework as I do it I think that it'll be very very good for someone who's learning. All right, any other questions? I really don't have a preferred MVC framework. I mean the truth of the matter is if I wasn't building one from scratch, I would actually be using using what I've already built in the past. I've always used my own frameworks. Exactly. The, the idea is that you want to separate your static files from your from your non-static files, but no, the public directory is not going to be containing the the other PHP files. Those will be in the classes directory, which is down here.
Notice it's not even accessible from the public directory because that keeps it protected from someone trying to directly access those files. So this index.php file, when we're done, is actually going to choose the appropriate classes file and then it's going to pass control of the operation to that file and in that way each piece of the program will pass control down a tree to whichever class is supposed to handle that request given whatever criteria we're looking for like whether or not they're logged in or not and so on. So all we really want in the public directory is probably just this index.php. I don't think we're going to want anything else in the public directory when we're done except we, we might let certain assets be directly accessible like for example image files things like that but I'm not even at that point yet so I'm not sure you, you could actually just use the index.php for that as well but I haven't decided yet so any other questions? Yes, I do own the live stream startup.com domain. What I'm going the, the reason the reason I'm not using that domain specifically for this is because I'm going to register a new domain for this project once I can decide on a name for the thing that I'm trying to build. I haven't thought of a name yet and I'm in no rush to find a name. Once I find a name then I'll register that domain but I pre-registered live, live stream startup because I'm going to be using that domain to kind of keep track of the whole live streaming aspect of this project and basically you know keep recordings of vid videos and notes and maybe sub tutorials things like that on that site. And there I'm not 100% sure when I'm going to get around to uploading the video from the last session, but this session is going to be available on justin.tv slash live comp sci for the next 48 hours and I'll, I'll probably upload it to YouTube over the next couple of days. And yes, I will be building this and really anything I build with a strong focus on security. In fact, we'll be, we'll be going over quite a few aspects of security as we go through the process. Oops, I need to do that. There, I just wanted to put the PHP code up so everybody can see that. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. All right, so in trying to decide a name for the thing that I'm building here, which is basically going to be a way for people to go out and post resumes, profiles, whatnot of themselves and for people to be able to go there and find who they want to work on their project. I am going to try to find a name that not only will, will sound good in terms of the domain name but also if someone goes to Google and searches for certain things I want them to find that site and if I pick the wrong name Wow, how, how do I explain this? Okay, so if you go to Google and you search for something, let's say let's say you search for um, freelancers for hire. Okay, so you you search for freelancers for hire, and there's going to be a lot of websites out there that are trying to rank high on Google for that specific keyword phrase, freelancers for hire. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that the domain name freelancersforhire.com is available, which it may or may not be. I'm just bringing this off the top of my head if that domain is available and if I chose it without first doing a bit of research as to how competitive that particular keyword phrase is 
then I could end up never getting any real traffic once once I get it on Google, even if people are specifically searching for the exact name of the thing that I came up with. So that that's one consideration when you're coming up with a domain name. The nice thing is a company, a website, doesn't have to have a name when you start building it. A lot of people get held up in their own process of starting a a business or a venture because they don't figure out what they're going to call it and so they never end up actually building anything and a lot of times that just happens as you build it out you start to figure out what you want to call it so once I get to the point that I have some candidate names in mind then I'll start doing a few searches on Google to basically see what is relatively non-competitive and then at that point I'll come up with a domain name and then I will try to get try to get it coming up on some Google searches all one step at a time so any other questions I don't know. Uh, it depends on it, it depends on a lot of factors. If I just had to throw out a number, I'd say a hundred sessions. Who knows? It might be fifty. Might be a hundred and fifty. It's way way too early to tell. Okay, so if you're a newcomer to a language and you don't know these functions already from experience, the best way honestly to find them is to go go to Google and type something like, you know, search for a string of text in PHP and you'll find the functions that way. I mean, the reason that I know which functions to use is because I have a lot of experience and I have I have the basic idea of what I'm looking for. Now, once you know the functions in one language you can usually when if you're learning a new language you can usually just just go to google and say okay you know in ruby for example how do i do the equivalent of pregmatch? match and you'll usually find a good answer that way i mean that's what you do in another thing too is that if you go to php.net every single php function is documented and you can just read through them. In fact, let me just show you something real quick here. So looking at my web browser here, if I go to php.net slash name of function, so pregmatch, match for example, I'll go straight to the page that tells me all about that function. It'll tell me the syntax to use, which is right here, and don't worry if that looks confusing, just process it in parts. You have first the pattern, which is this, then the subject, which is the thing that you're actually searching through, which in this case is the request URI, and then lastly you want the array, which will contain the matches, which I have right here is dollar sign P matches. In PHP all variables begin with a dollar sign, it's just how you identify that they're variables, and it tells you all of that here, and it gives you some nice examples of exactly how to use it, and then you have all kinds of comments on more information you can have on that. So look here, so we're, we're in text processing. If I go to text processing I can immediately see all the functions related to text processing. Now let's say I go to php.net str replace and again you see here it's under text processing under strings under string functions so if I go to string functions here I can see these are all the functions PHP allows and don't be overwhelmed by this you you only need some at any given time so if you're so if you give this a very cursory look you can usually see here 
something you're looking for, like strcmp, string comparison. So if you're looking for a function to do string comparison, you can usually find it there. And yeah, PHP has absolutely fantastic documentation. Everything you could want. So that's how you do that. MVC is a type of methodology for development in general. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a type of way of doing things. It's, it's not an object in and of itself. You don't refer to an MVC, for example. An MVC framework is a framework built on the MVC, I guess you could say, philosophy, which is to have the model, the view, and the controller. And let's see what else. Okay, so any other questions? Here's what I think we're going to do from now on. Whenever I ask if there's any questions and there's a pause there, I think that what we'll do from now on is if anyone has a question at any given time, just type Q and enter. That way I can see that there's a question incoming. That way I'm not waiting for people to type out a question and people aren't waiting through the pause when I'm just saying, you know, does anyone have any questions? So if you have a question at any time, just write Q into the chat, just Q enter, and then I'll know you have a question. And that's how we'll do that from now on. It'll make things go a little smoother. So, seeing that no one has done that, I'm assuming that there aren't any more questions. So we'll go ahead and call this a day, and I hope that everybody enjoyed the session. So I will be here tomorrow at the same time, and then the next session will be Monday. Again, this is every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So everybody have a good evening, and see you tomorrow.